Karen Maravich, and I chair the Tuolumne County Democratic Central Committee. We also have two other official Democratic organizations in Tuolumne County. The Tuolumne County Democratic Club and the Democratic Women's Coalition of Tuolumne County. So my thought would be if everyone who belongs to one of those groups would stand up, we can all applaud you. for uh, California Democratic Party director, and that's Amy Champ. Amy, by any chance, did you make it up the hill to be with us this evening? All right, at least you need to know Amy is representing a whole bunch of counties in California for the California Democratic Party, and she's our go-to person for a lot of information. Uh, I don't know how we could go much further without introducing Mayor Jim Garaventa. Jim is standing right back there. He's the mayor of the city of Sonora. And he has recently joined on the city council by the sixth woman in 167 years to serve on the Sonora City Council. So, and she's a Democrat. <laughs> and also this evening, we have the pleasure of being able to recognize Ryan Campbell. Ryan is running for District 2 Board of Supervisors Chambers, and he's sitting right over there. As I gaze out at all of you this evening, what I see is Democrats, Californians, and Americans. I also see many volunteers who have demonstrated and organized around such important issues as climate change, uh, immigration, uh, single-payer health care, better wages, uh, education, human rights, gun control, a woman's right to choose, and so many other immense issues, issues that are of such immense importance to our country. We live in, in, in turbulent political times, but our indomitable democratic spirit will triumph over the chaos and lies that are coming out of Washington, D.C. We will take back the House of Representatives this year and maybe even the Senate. We're on the home stretch of an effort to steer America in the right direction. And some of the people who could do just that are with us here this evening as speakers. And of course, all of you have immense power yourselves to make change. Uh, before we go any further, I think it's important that we give some thank yous. First of all, thank you, Sonora Taqueria. They are our caterers. If there's any food left over, be feel, feel free at the end of the evening to stop by uh, where Sergio is located and take some home for a future time at no cost. Also, to remember that Sonora Taqueria has a restaurant in downtown Sonora, just a couple doors north of the Union Democrat. Mm -hmm. My next thank you would be in order to Highway 49 Revisited which was our musical entertainment this evening. And if you notice, if you were... If you were paying attention to what music they were playing, you know that they were the songs of Nobel Laureate Bob Dylan. <laughs> Our artists for this evening were uh, Gary Linehan and Sean Brennan. And uh, this is all of their equipment, and they very kindly allowed us to use their microphone. We have another thank you for all the volunteers who set up the tables and chairs for this event in total sunshine. This was nothing but sun and hot and quite an effort. There's over 27 tables and close to 200 chairs. We have, as I say, close to 200 people here this evening. And that is a, an amazing tribute to the enthusiasm that we have as Democrats in Tuolumne County. 
Uh, I'm afraid that I need to mention that all of this needs to be taken down at the end of the evening and put away. So if any of you have any extra time and would care to carry a chair or a table, we'd really be appreciative of that. I'm pleased to announce that Democratic Headquarters uh, is open in downtown Sonora. Uh, you heard earlier that it is located on Washington Street between the uh, stoplight and where Umpa Bank used to be. We, as United Democrats, meaning the club, the coalition, and the Central Committee, are sharing space in the former Main Street shop with a Jessica Morse campaign. So we really have kind of a United Democratic front there. There's a lot of literature on the table over here for you to take. It will be available at the headquarters as well. And uh, we uh, need volunteers for keeping our headquarters open. And Palma uh, has a sign-up sheet over at the table where you came in. And there's also a sign-up sheet on uh, Jessica's table for those of you who would care to volunteer for her campaign. Believe me, it's an endless task and most of the stuff you can learn in five minutes to do, it's just not rocket science. It just gets people out to vote, gets them motivated. Um, now it's our great good fortune to hear from the Democratic speakers who have decided and, and were pleased to join us this evening. We're going to begin with Lori Sylvester. This is Lori's home territory. Lori used to be on the Board of Supervisors representing District 3, and this evening she's going to tell us why she wants to represent District 3 again, and we can hear a little bit more about her. Lori? As a microphone test, welcome to Twain Heart, my hometown. Can you hear me? Right on. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here tonight. I lived about a mile just at the other end of the golf course is where I moved here in 1961. Taught at Twain Hart Elementary, Somerville Elementary, and Columbia College. Tonight I'd like to dedicate what I have to say to Aretha Franklin. <laughs> who through song gave voice so that many, for so many, she gave voice to so many people. She's now passed, but her words will live forever. And Aretha brought many dissimilar people together. Shall we consider others who have done so? During the Vietnam War, people had lived, worked, worshipped in homogenous groups. Yet, largely due to the draft, the military united dissimilar groups for a specific purpose. Returning veterans who opted to go to college on the GI Bill, um, I, had, I benefited from, as they were in many of the classes that I was in, but I benefited from studying with a diverse group of vets. They were unafraid of asserting their views in open debate. They worked out big ideas together, many voices at one table. Fast forward 20 years. As a college professor, I taught students who identified as being in recovery. They came from different backgrounds. Substance abuse knows and knew no boundaries. In recovery were former teachers, bankers, clerks, social workers, church folks, Republicans, Democrats, and a variety of cultural and ideological backgrounds. This dissimilar group of people shared a common goal. They support each other in public. Someone or some call each other brother or they call each other sister and they share each other's sobriety birthdays. They support each other in public. So these two examples display out of one many, e pluribus unum, that's us, e pluribus unum. unum. Each is a coalition united in the face of difficulty and conflict. Each joined forces working toward a common cause and united in a shared vision. And Sharon just talked about some of the things that unite us together in our shared vision. When I loosely consider the recovery model, not having firsthand knowledge of the actual process, it occurs to me 
that our Democratic Party could benefit from working together in recovery. Our Democratic Party has diverse voices and a mix of people pursuing a wide array of issues. People that are passionate, passionate about the flag that they bear with the desire for their issues to be addressed on equal footing with all others. And that flag is planted. Each side digs in. And regrettably, some have bitter words and exchanges. And our eyes have been lowered from the goal. Squabbles do drive away others. But might we agree, might we agree that recovery would be useful? Could we set aside weapons of words and weapons of words that are used in social media to build a coalition working together and working toward common goals. In, in choosing our issues, consider the dynamics of each district. Now in my district, District 3, which goes from Sonora Pass to where the Dunell fire is currently burning, down toward Miwok, follows Highway 108, comes into Twain Heart, Twain Heart Valley and Lakewood, goes over toward um, Tuolumne and all the way down to Ward's Ferry Road. In that District 3, 66% of the people voted for President Trump. I'm a moderate in a district with the majority of moderate voters that include nonpartisans, Democrats, and Republicans. And I genuinely want to lead. I want to lead with projects that serve everyone. As former county supervisor, it was 99 till 2003. Um, of the more than 1,500 votes that I took in those four years, I can't remember any liberal or conservative votes in that period of time. The votes were to split properties so that the next generation could build a home next to their parents. They were votes to build and repair bridges or votes about land use planning and infrastructure and voting to try a different way, just one time to distribute local road repair money equally to each district. We did that. So votes were about public safety and the loss of volunteer firefighters. And they were about child protective services, social services, libraries, recreation, refuse collection, and much, much more. So those issues rely on cooperative funding from our local, our state, and our federal representatives. And I'm really grateful for the candidates that are here tonight, and I really look forward to working with every single one of them. So we have over 77% public land in Tuolumne County, so we must ask for a larger portion of federal financial share to continue to improve our stewardship of these public lands, our watershed, our trees, and our refuge for wild critters. These lands are held in trust for U.S. citizens. Our resolve will not grow stronger by being surrounded with those who agree. It grows stronger being tested by those who do not. We must establish dialogues, the harder road to travel. Diplomacy trumps might. We're a democratic nation ruled by law, guided by our constitution. This moderate, will not stand silent in the face of injustice. I will not shrink in front of a bully. I'll speak truth to power, and I'll always, always be a good steward of the lands that we're blessed to live in. I'm Lori Sylvester. I'm running for county supervisor. I'm committed to building community through bipartisan coalitions to bring differences or to bring differences coming together over common needs. And thank you very much for being here this evening. get back on District 3 board. Uh, <clears throat> Carla Neal is our uh, Democratic nominee for Assembly in District 5 in which we're located. Carla could not be with us this evening and she sends her regrets. And she also sends Ann Leonard who's going to make a, a presentation on her behalf. Thank you, Sharon. 
As Sharon said, I'm Ann Leonard and I'm representing Carla Neal tonight. Uh, Carla has many responsibilities and one of those is teaching at Fresno City College. Tonight is her very first class for the semester, so she can't be here. She also has a notary business, a mobile notary business. But Carla is passionate about wanting to represent California District, Assembly District 5 against Frank Bigelow. Uh, Carla has a, an impressive history. She's worked, taught from kindergarten through college, and so she's very passionate about public education. We all should pu support public education because it benefits everyone. It benefits the students who are in public education. And if money is siphoned off to go to private schools, those students are cheated out of a quality education because the, the meager budget they have is reduced. It also affects those students who go to private school because they don't have the opportunity to have classes, to get to know people of different classes. And it weakens our democracy because if we don't have a common education, common goals with people working together, the rich get richer, the poor get poorer, the people with the connections that they earn in private school are the ones who benefit from education that's being taken away from public education. Education is not Carla's only uh, issue. She supports the public platform which wants to have not only quality education for everyone, but also affordable housing for everyone, the homeless as well as everyone else. She supports good environmental stewardship and was a co-founder of, I have to look at this, of AG Green Biofuels Co-op. So Carla has been involved in education and environmental issues for a long, long time. She is running against Frank Bigelow. If you don't know the record of Frank Bigelow, he doesn't live in our district. He lives down in the valley, even though he's representing the Sierras. He is a voted against every issue that has come up that protects the environment. He's voted against uh, it, uh, biomass. He's voted against green energy. He's voted against environmental protection. He also voted against the clean money bill. What politician wouldn't want clean money? Frank Bigelow doesn't. He voted against the ivory ban. He also voted against the new voter motor act. Frank Bigelow does not represent us. Carla Neal will vote for us, not for the polluters. So in closing, I would like to urge all of you to vote for Carla Neal. Thank you. Thank you, Ann. Now it's time to hear from Paulina Miranda. Paulina is running for state senate. The good news is that the incumbent was turned out, so this is an open seat. So we have a chance to make a Democrat uh, get elected and fill that seat. So you will find that Paulina is very enthusiastic and you will enjoy hearing from her. Paulina? Thank you, Charon. Thank you for having us here. I really appreciate it to all of you to be here with us this beautiful evening. 
I took a lot of pictures of the trees who sat at your back that probably for you is normal. But for me, it's just amazing. Being here with you, being in Ptolemy, and I'm coming here to ask you to vote for me. I'm Paulina Miranda, and I'm running for state senator, District 8. A lot of people ask me, what's mean that, no? where you are? What's mean District 8? District 8 have 11 counties, and it's coming from Tulare until at the North Sacramento. And at the West, we have more or less the Freeway 99, and at the East, I have Mono and India. So it's a very big area who have a lot of issues, a lot of situations very special in this area. I'm here to ask you to vote for me. I'm here demanding your support. I'm here because I want the primary. I'm here because I have the endorsement of the California Democratic Party. I'm very proud. I'm very proud to be a Democrat as you, my friends. My family had a nun in the family, and she was coming every year to Los Angeles. I was living in Pico Rivera. And she was coming, and she was telling to my mom, Maria, give me one of your daughters. I want them to be nuns. And my mom was saying, no, 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 no nuns. <laughs> so eventually, she changed. She changed, and she said, after five years to come in with the same message, she came back and she said, well, give me one of your daughters. And I can send her in Mexico City, because the nun was coming from Mexico City, and I can put her at the university over there. So finally, my big sister said, yeah, I want to go with the nun. And she was over there. When I was finished my high school, my mom told me, you should go to Mexico City. And I said, why? I don't want to go to Mexico City so far. And I was 14 years old. And my mom told me, you should go to Mexico City because I say that and because you should take care of your sister. <laughs> and I went, mom, my sister is tough. My sister is four years bigger than me. And she said, yeah, but she needs you. So you should go. So I went to Mexico City. I finished uh, my bachelor over there, and I'm pharmacist, chemist, and biologist. But I did it that because my sister, my tall sister, told me, you should be a chemist. And I was, no, I want to be a lawyer. I said, no, 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 you're very bright. So you should do whatever I said. <laughs> and I'm here doing my dream being a politician. I'm at the Fresno County Democratic Central Committee since 2002. I covered already, you know, all the positions that you can imagine that you can have in the party. And when I arrived at the Fresno County Democratic Central Committee, sometimes we don't even have quorum to, to have the meetings. I know what it means. Being with three, three people, ten people, seven people, just looking at each other. That's what I'm very proud of you. Hello, I'm speaking to you. <laughs> I'm very proud of you. Because right now, look at all of this. It's beautiful. As a Democrat, I'm very proud of you. And I also want you to be very proud of me as your next senator. So I came here to ask you for your support your economical support, your vote, and I need you to help me to win Ptolemy, because without you, we cannot do it. Ptolemy is very, very important county for District 8, so I need your support. When I went to the university, I had two very big honors. The first one started when, in the first semester, 
None of the groups, it was 64 students, none of the groups was passing physics class. So it was, it was terrible, you know, I never, I always pass all the, the subjects, so it was terrible for me thinking that at the university level, I don't will pass. So we did teams. We resolved all the problems in the book. And at that uh, time, I was saying that in the group, we have 13 genius, and I. <laughs> and of course, the genius was in it. So we did a team. We fixed it. We resolved all the problems in the book, and we passed. Oh my god, the gifts because we passed was that they called me and they told me they want to prepare myself to be a physics teacher for the pharmacist. And I was like, <laughs> you know, that's such an honor that I cannot say no. So I did it. And when I finished my career, I was uh, having three groups of physics for myself. And I was having a lot of success because I, even though I have a very complicated mind because of my knowledge, I was trying to be as simple as possible for the people. And I continue to be the same because I think that if you can be clear, if anybody can understand what you said, then it would be more easy for us to understand each other. So I'm planning to be a senator. So I want to come and listen to you. I'm here to listen to you. I want to hear what do you need, what do you want, but not right now. <laughs> From now until I went to the Senate and all the time. So my point is, I'm here for you. And the Senate, I will be there for you. So I will be the one who will help you to resolve the issues that we have in Trollamy County. So please call me. Please be with me. I went to the San Claus University, and you know what? I was over there, and when I finished, I asked the students about their issues. And for my surprise, one of them told me, Paulina, we are hungry. <laughs> I was, oh my God, what do you say? We are hungry. That's my problem, but you cannot help me. And I went, why I cannot help you? Of course I can help you. Let me see what I can do. I have some friends in the Senate. So I was speaking with the Senate, and marvelous Kevin DeLeon came to the University of Stanislaus to speak with them. I couldn't be with you because I was sick that day. I was putting my signs in a dog by me. <laughs> so he put me in the bed, that little dog. That's why I couldn't be with you in Stanislaus at the Stanislaus University. But uh, it was marvelous, it was beautiful when they realized that, yes, we can help. We always can help each other. And they was very, very happy to receive these meals. And not just the University of Stanislaus, all the universities in California. So I was very pleased to me and having that conversation with them and to receive uh, this help from Senator Karen DeLeon. Thank you, Senator. <laughs> when I was at the Friend of County Democratic Central Committee um, like 14 years ago, we started the Healthcare for All movement. I am one of the co-founders of this movement in California. At that time, most of the people in the Fresno County, they just want to work over there. I was the one who was going to all the meetings at the state level, and I had the opportunity to start that movement. I just cannot understand how I was living in Mexico and 
I don't even what was working, and I was having access to health. And now living in California, the people don't want having access to health care. So I really don't understood that. So when they started that movement and they informed me and then they told me I was the one who was going to all the meetings at state level. And I'm very glad that uh, one of our senators right now is uh, pushing that bill. And I hope when I arrive to the Senate, we can finish with that and we ha can have health care for everybody in California. Because we deserve that and much more than that. I know that uh, some of the seniors in Ptolemy told me that they have a concern about their family members who said leaving the county and then they don't come back because they don't have a place where to live and because they don't have a work. A work can help fit uh, their necessities and specialities. So um, I really believe in the economic development of California. And I think if we work together, we can create more jobs, different types of jobs for the people, for their sons, for their daughters, so they can come back and be with us. Because when I was studying, so far of my family, I always was thinking, I want to be with my family. I want to come back. And God help me, and I'm here in California again. So thank you. Thank you very much for listening to me. I really appreciate it that you are here with us. And to the victory in November for the Democrats. Thank you. Thank you, Paulina. Uh, Eleni Kunawakis is one of two Democrats who are running for lieutenant governor. Eleni would have loved to have been with us this evening, but she was unable to find the time in her schedule to be here, and she sends her regrets. However, she's more than ably represented by Elmi Bernejo, who is representing Elmi and would like to talk to you. And also note that we do have a lot of Elmi's uh, literature on our table, and we will have some, at, well, we do now, in our headquarters. Elmi? Thank you, and good evening, everyone. It's a real honor to be here with all of you tonight. Um, I want to thank Sharon Maravich for welcoming us here when Eleni did her first road tour last year. Elaine Hagen was kind enough to organize a group of folks to listen to why Eleni Kunalakis was interested in being the next lieutenant governor. So thank you for that. She not only welcomed us, gave Eleni a tour of the pine bark beetle infestation, and um, we talked about that with Eleni, something that she's talked about on the campaign trail. So thank you for welcoming our campaign tonight. I want to tell you a little bit about Eleni Kunalakis, who is not only my friend, but I think uh, somebody that I truly believe is going to represent all of us very well in the state of California as our next lieutenant governor. I first met Eleni, well, I've known of her family's philanthropy for many years. But we met officially in 2016 uh, in Las Vegas canvassing for Hillary Clinton. And then we became fast friends. Oh, and by the way, she had a, a broken um, ankle. And here she was. She, uh, she brought her two sons to canvas. She made them go out and meet people and go knock on doors. And she stayed and made phone calls to people because she couldn't really walk. So after that, when she decided she was going to run, we talked about this, and she said, I'm going to run for office. What do you think? I said, I really care what you're running for. How can I help? And next thing you know, I planned the trip to the 58 counties in California, and we went from Trinity to Calexico, where last of the, yeah, it's amazing trip, and then you realize the beauty of our state, the beauty of the people of California, so much talent, so many wonderful things, and yet 
it was just eye-opening to hear that so many people don't always get to these parts when they're running for office. So when you see people out there, you know, go making it to a lot of events, uh, and with 39, I think, what is that, so many, 20, 39 million Californians, it's hard to cover every corner. But I just want to tell you a little bit that not only did any, she was here a year ago on the 23rd of July in Sonora, and then we went on to Calaveras. We were also um, in Amador County making our trip throughout the state. And one of the things that she's very interested in, as you know, the Lieutenant Governor serves on the CSU and the UC Board of Regents. And what that means is that as we have gone on our trip to California, Eleni has visited Chico State, Humboldt State, Stanislaus County, UC Merced, UC Riverside, met with the president of those universities, met with students to say, what is it that we as a state need to do for our students so that they're not living in their cars, that the tuition isn't so astronomically high that they can't really pay it back. We've also talked about the fact that the Lieutenant Governor sits on the Economic Development Commission. We just came back from San Bernardino and Riverside. We met with the Inland Empire Economic Partnership and with the Chamber in the city of Fontana. And the questions there are, who do you go to as a business person when you have problems? And how can the Office of Economic Development help you with your business? What impediments are there to be a successful business person? There's also the issue of that the Lieutenant Governor would sit on the State Lands Commission. If any of you saw some of Eleni's commercials, it was about protecting our coast, open spaces. All these issues are something she is more than willing and has been rolling her sleeves getting out there, talking to people to be a problem solver. Time and time again, as we've met with people, she's talked about what her priorities are going to be, and again, why uh, people need to vote, and come out and vote. You know, she says that we're part of a participatory democracy, but for the people, by the people, but people have to come out and vote. And so the, the fact that you're all here tonight to listen to all the speakers, everybody presenting their case is a wonderful and a phenomenal thing about our democracy and that we get out there and make sure that not only our voices are heard to the people that we elect, but we continue to be with them so that they show up in our communities, not just every two years or every four years, but all the time in our communities. A little bit else about uh, Eleni Kunalakis. She was born in Sacramento. People say, oh, you were from San Francisco. Her family is from Sacramento. She was born in Sacramento. Her two boys were born in Sacramento. She married a wonderful man named Marcos Kunalakis, who lives in Sacramento, so she and her boys live in San Francisco now. She, her first job was at the, with the California Democratic Party. And ever since there, she's been a philanthropist, and through her work as a, a Democrat, making sure she's reaching out to a lot of people, she was appointed by President Barack Obama to be our U.S. Ambassador in Hungary, where she served for three years. And we're very proud that last week, President Barack Obama endorsed our campaign. So we're very proud of that. Thank you. And one more thing about Eleni is that when you think about people stepping up to run for office, Eleni Kunalakis would be the first woman elected to be Lieutenant Governor of California. And that's no small measure, because even though there are fabulous men out there, sometimes, as my friend Jane used to say, oh, but some of you are sitting in our seats. <laughs> so think about that. So she's a hard worker, and I can tell you, you get to know a person when you're traveling with them to 58 counties. You get to know how hard they work, what they pay attention to, and after 58 counties, I can tell you, I would travel, and I have to continue to travel with Eleni to other counties, because her heart is in the right place. She's smart, she's a hard worker, and she has a commitment to our state that is phenomenal. So thank you for the opportunity to address you tonight. I hope that all of you will go out and vote. And of course, deep in my heart, I hope that you will all vote for Eleni Kunalakis, for Lieutenant Governor of our great state of California. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elmay. Now it's Jessica Morse's opportunity to speak to you. 
She's our congressional nominee who believes it's time that uh, our representative in Congress be focused on what can he, can he or she, especially she, uh, can do for her constituents and not just partisan politics. So Jessica, please come to the microphone. such an incredible crowd. You guys have been working so hard for our campaign and for our community and, and this county and our district and our country. And you should be so proud of all of your hard work because it is paying off. How many of you guys came out and have uh, knocked on doors for us or made phone calls? Amazing. I want to see all hands up the, the next time I ask that question, okay? Um, how many of you guys have, have supported the campaign financially and made a cut? That's incredible. That's amazing. You guys are the grassroots momentum that is allowing us to change the political culture, uplift our country, and, and win in November. You are the foundation, and I am just honored to have all of you on the team. So anyone here not seen me speak before? Anyone need? Okay, let me give you a little background then. Um, so I am actually five generations from our district. My great great grandparents came over on covered wagons. You know, unlike the Donner Party, they made it. So proud of them. And uh, and we still have the original homestead forest land up in Gold Run, about 200 acres. I have a cousin up there with a micro mill. He selectively logs the trees, keeps that forest healthy because I grew up knowing that a healthy forest is a managed forest, which we're gonna talk about in just a minute. And uh, did any of you guys see our TV commercials around the primary? They were up on digital ads and stuff. So I got to go, That we had photos of my great grandma Edith, who manned the telegraph booth at Donner Pass at the turn of the century. So I got to dig through Edith's trunk from 1905, and I found this photo of her tromping around in a long woolen dress, heeled boots, and in the snow around Donner Pass, she had a little shotgun on her shoulder. And below it said, eat it, hunting. <laughs> so I come from very hardy mountain stock. And I grew up hiking and fishing and backpacking and camping all over our district. I've actually hiked the entire district on the Pacific Crest Trail. So it's about 500 miles. Um, from Sierra City all the way down to Mount Whitney. Um, would always come off the trail here on a backpacking trip to grab some food. And you know, when you feed a backpacker, it's like feeding four people. So you're welcome um, for the small businesses here. Um, and I just, I know how gorgeous our district is. You know who hasn't hiked our entire district? <laughs> Tom McClintock. So you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna tell him to take a hike. <laughs> Because he does not understand our community. He's a career politician from Southern California who never moved to our district. He doesn't evacuate from forest fires. You know, he is not wondering if he can pay his fire insurance. He is not wondering um, if he should continue to live in an area that is prone to forest fires. He is not facing the impact of the people in our community, and therefore he votes against us. He is somebody who votes party line. He votes with his party 97% of the time. He votes with our community, I think, about 0% of the time. You know, he voted to take away um, health care from people with pre-existing conditions. I have a pre-existing condition. It's called being a woman. <laughs> <laughs> And, you know, and that, that includes 300,000 people in our district. That has a very direct impact on their lives, whether they have a gene for cancer or asthma or any number of things that impact our community. And McClintock is ignoring them and voting against our neighbors. He's somebody who voted for the tax bill. You know, the tax bill increased the taxes um, of people, of four in 10 people in our district at an average price of $5,000 a person because what you can't do is subtract your state income taxes off of your federal anymore. You know, he also, that tax bill, also took away funding, a, a, a financing mechanism 
that developers were using to be able to build much needed workforce housing throughout our district with very little cost to our taxpayers. He's voting against our community. And worse off, he is the guy who has voted, he blocked funding for fire prevention. He voted against the 2017 bill that would have brought um, natural disaster assistance to our district. He voted to, to continue the hiring freeze on the federal government, which has allowed there to be 700 vacancies in the Forest Service in Region 5, in our region, which means we can't manage the forest even if we had the resources to do it because we don't have the people. We don't have the staff to issue the permits to get the small logging operations going, to allow ranchers to go in and start grazing our communities down, you know, to start grazing down these post-burn areas and, and certain areas. And, and he is not funding or supporting innovative approaches like biomass facilities that will allow us to take forest waste and turn it into energy and good paying jobs for our community. When I started my campaign, I did a listening tour of the district, went to all 10 counties, met with our county supervisors, local Cal Fire chiefs, hospital boards. I heard really innovative approaches to, um, to jump-starting rural economies, creating good jobs that are demanded here, um, improving rural health care, improving infrastructure, watershed management, um, access to rural broadband. How many of you guys have trouble with internet? Yeah, everybody, right? And, um, and by the way, just fun fact, McClintock voted against the Rural Broadband Act. So guess what? Our, but it passed. So our tax dollars are paying for broadband to go down in Alaska and Kansas, but not here because we don't have a member of Congress to fight for those resources to come back here. And that's what I heard consistently from every, every local elected and every community leader that I met. Didn't matter if they were Republican or Democrat. I heard innovative solutions to the challenges we face, and I heard that we are missing a partner and an advocate to bring resources back to these solutions and break down that red tape so the solutions will stick. And you know what, I thought I can do that. I can be a partner for our community and I can advocate for our rural districts that don't have a voice because we demand a voice. And one thing I understand is that, that the issues we face here, they're not partisan. You know, a forest fire is not asking if you're a Republican or a Democrat before it burns down your home. <laughs> and when I first started running here, people said, well, Jessica, it's a historically conservative district. How are you going to do this? And I said, don't you worry. I've got a secret. I come from a historically conservative family right here. I've got about 130 family members, most of whom are conservative, all of whom are great canvassers. <laughs> And I got them on board because I recognized that the values that I learned in this conservative family are not just conservative values. Let me tell you what they were. We learned the value of hard work and education and that everyone deserves a shot at hard work and education. We learned the value of being wise stewards of our hard-earned tax dollars. We learned the value of sustaining the land that sustains us and sustaining the planet that sustains us because I was trained in a family that we make decisions that will be legacies for future generations, not short-term gains for private corporations. You know, we think long-term. <laughs> and most of all, I learned the value of service. My mom had us out cleaning up trails and rivers and volunteering at the local nursing home every weekend. And I love that, that ability to give back to our community and see an impact from our work. And so it was natural for me to then take my career and dedicate it to public service. I spent 10 years all over the world with the Defense Department, State Department, and USAID. I was on the ground in Baghdad for about a year and a half at the height of the war. And every day in Iraq, I was seeing the consequence of, of politicians who are making short-sighted decisions that got them a political cheer line and got them through the next political cycle. But we were living out the real-life consequences of those decisions 
and living the risk of them. And those consequences could last a century. And it was when I was in Iraq, it was the first time it really occurred to me that perhaps our country and our community would be better off if we stopped electing politicians and instead start electing public servants. Because we deserve leaders who are going to fight for solutions that will last centuries, not just political cycles. And that's what we're doing, because right now we have a politician in there who is voting consistently with his special interest donors and voting consistently against our community, and we deserve better. And what's exciting is that a campaign where I spend a lot of time talking about beetle kill and forest fire prevention and rural broadband and local issues is getting national attention and national momentum. And that's because of your hard work. You know, we have out-fundraised Tom McClintock every quarter we've been in. We've raised over $1.5 million. And that's thanks to all of you. That came from over 8,000 individual contributions. That's because everybody is stepping up and chipping in and recognizing that we have to put the investment in. Because when I get elected, we're going to work to get money out of politics, let me tell you. But right now, the reality is we have to get on TV. So, <laughs> so we're going to go change the rules. I like to think of us like Picasso. You know, he learned all the rules of classical painting, and then he changed all the rules. So that's what we're going to do. We are going to out-message and out-organize McClintock, and we're going to get in, and we're going to change all the rules so that it's not going to require $1.5 million. It's just going to require all of our hard work. But guess what we're doing in addition to the funding. The real cornerstone of our campaign is all of you who are out knocking on doors, having face-to-face -face conversations with neighbors. Our volunteers in all 10 counties throughout the district, in, in the primary, reached out to over 65,000 voters on phones and on doors. I myself knocked on over 1,000 doors before the primary. I even canvassed a bear, actually, one day. <laughs> So it's fun canvassing here. But let me tell you, when we go and talk to our neighbors and have those face-to-face -face conversations, we really understand what's going on. You know, I talked to a guy one day, and he said he has a micro mill and, and logs trees. And I said, oh, great. Do you ever log beetle kill? Because how many of you guys have beetle kill trees on your property? Couldn't find a place for them to go. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you guys have to pay $1,000 to get those trees out unless PG&E does it, right? And that's expensive for our community. So I thought, well, wouldn't it be great if we can find solutions and ways, you know, for Beetle Kill to go become furniture? Like just walk into a Union Hill coffee shop. The whole, Troy actually did the whole coffee shop in Beetle Kill Pine. It's lovely accent. They're, they're marketing in San Francisco as Alpine Blue or Sapphire Pine. And I would joke that I was like, well, if we could just make this blue pine auspicious in China, we'd be set. So I meet this guy, Gary. And he's got a mill, it's been, he's been a, a logger his whole life. And I said, do you ever do anything with beetle kill? He said, actually, that's my whole job. He said, my whole industry is beetle kill. I was like, this is amazing. And then he said, I said, you, I said what do you do with it? He said, well, I slab it and I ship it to China. I was like, oh my gosh, how do we scale this up? And he said, well, actually, we don't. And I said, well, why? He said, my business shut down two weeks ago because of the tariffs. Yeah, it's having a real impact on us. And I was up in another part of the district in Apple Hill. Any of you guys been up to Apple Hill? There are good pies up here, but there's, pre there's pretty good pies. Um, you can get a slice of apple pie the size of your head. It's a gem. It's like a national treasure in and of itself. And their main industry is pie sales. And I was talking to this woman. She's had her, her apple orchard for six generations. Makes pies that are, you know, six generations recipe passed down. They're phenomenal. She said she's not sure she can really swing the pie sales this year. And I said, why not? She said the aluminum tariffs increased the pie price of pie plates. And it eroded her profit margin. Tom McClintock won't even fight for apple pie, folks.
so we are sending him back to Southern California where he came from. We're going to keep the water, by the way. Um, and we are getting rid of him because we deserve somebody who's going to stand up for us. We deserve somebody who recognizes that the values we as a community have, they're not conservative values, they're not progressive values, they are American values. And they are community values. And we deserve somebody who's going to be a partner and advocate for every member of our community, regardless of their political party, because we deserve that foundation. And we are going to do it with your help. Because we have Kara here, and all of you are going to sign up with Kara and sign up for a Canvas shift. We have our office open in Sonora. We are launching Canvases every weekend. I think we got one going tomorrow morning. Um, we have phone banks going most nights. You can come in and write postcards. But we need to be able to do this by having those face-to-face -face conversations with neighbors. When we talk to our neighbors, it doesn't matter how many ads McClintock puts on the TV or how many mailers he puts out because we're gonna silence them because our community is stronger than that. The tone we're setting with our campaign is the feeling I had when I was down volunteering with the, the victims of the Detweiler fire last summer or the um, Ferguson fire just a couple last week. Nobody in that relief center saw themselves as a Republican or Democrat. We all saw each other as members of the community rolling up our sleeves and getting to work. And when we go talk to our neighbors, that's the tone we need to take. We need to remind each other that we're neighbors and we have common challenges that are facing us all and we deserve a representative who understands that. So I'm committing to you guys today that when I get into Congress, I'm going to hold myself to a higher standard. I'm calling it the new Morse code. <laughs> yeah. It's a dad joke. It was my dad's idea. We're going to win with it. <laughs> the new Morse code is my commitment to ensuring that we fight for solutions that last centuries, not just political cycles. It's my commitment to ensuring that we are always going to put our community and our country first above partisan games. And it is my commitment to never stooping to the mentality of a politician, but always uplifting this political culture so that I will always be a public servant. And when we're all out here doing this, what we are doing, we're not just changing the political party that's in power. What we are doing is uplifting the political culture to ensure that when, when your children and when your children's children run for office, it is about the issues that our communities face. It's about standing up and fighting for our neighbors regardless of their skin color, political party affiliation, you know, ethnic background, you know, socioeconomic status, education level. It is about fighting for our neighbors and our community. And let me tell you, your grandkids and great-grandkids are going to remember this election. They are going to read about the 2018 election in their history books. And they are going to read about it as a tipping point in American history. Yeah. And when they look back and read about that and ask themselves, wow, how did they win in 2018? Because we're going to win in 2018. When they look back, they're going to look back on us the way I look back on my grandma who was, my great grandma who was a, who was marching with the suffragettes to give me the right to vote and the right to run for office, right? I'm going to look back at them with pride. They're going to look back on us the way I look back on my grandfather who was in World War II and rode his ship into Pearl Harbor. Because my great grandma and my grandfather and our ancestors answered the call. A moment in history like this does not come along every generation. They recognize that they had a moment and the opportunity to make an impact that would last legacies. And we have that opportunity. So when future generations read about us and they ask, how did we win? You know what the answer is going to be? It's going to be communities like us. People like us who stepped up 
and recognized that we had an opportunity to make a change, who saw the danger of the situation that we're in and who didn't rest and who did everything in our power to ensure that we could win. So I am honored to be standing at this incredible moment in history with all of you. I am so grateful to have you all on our team because you have made this momentum happen. And I am just thrilled to be able to, to, be able to stand here with all of you as, as we change history. And it's because of you that we're gonna win in November. And it's because of you that we're gonna make history. So thank you. Thank you, Jessica. We can only wish you a tremendous amount of good luck and keep up the good work. I think when our keynote speaker accepted our invitation to attend this evening, I think he didn't realize that he was going to make a little bit of history because he's the only, de only male to be represented <laughs> among the six speakers. Usually it's just the reverse if we can even get one woman. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Kevin DeLeon, who is currently a member of the State Senate, but at one time was the President Pro Tem of the State Senate. Uh, he is seeking to represent us in uh, the uh, U.S. Senate. He believes uh, we are in a historic struggle for the soul of America against a president who doesn't have a soul. Uh, uh, Senator DeLeon has an impressive record fighting for Californians, and now is his opportunity to tell us about himself and what he hopes to accomplish if elected as a U.S. Senator. Uh, Senator DeLeon, it's your turn. And I did not ask you this question, but at the end of the program, do you mind coming back and pulling the winning ticket of our 50-50 raffle? Thank you. It should be a drawing, it's not a raffle. Thank you so much, Sharon. Thank you so much. 12 May County Democrats, how are we feeling tonight? I said, how are we feeling tonight? I can say this. I am incredibly honored and proud to be here with each and every one of you. Uh, to come out here to God's country, to be here in Twain Heart is an incredible honor for me. And to Sharon, thank you very much for growing this Democratic Party here in Tuolumne County is incredible work. Let's get up for Sharon. Now, I, I think there's a lot of folks here who don't know me and perhaps may have heard of me. And I will take this moment to introduce myself to each and every one of you. My name is Kevin DeLeon. I'm the youngest child of a single immigrant mother with a third grade education. I'm the youngest in my family and the only one to graduate from high school in my family, let alone go on to higher education. Now, I learned the value of hard work from a single mother who was a woman who worked her fingers to the bone, who worked in a very wealthy enclave in Southern California, in San Diego to be specific. You may have heard of it, it's a community called La Jolla, California. The beautiful palatial homes on top of the hill with the ocean panoramic views of the Pacific Ocean. And there my mother worked every single day, her fingers to the bone, spending the vast majority of the day, if not her entire life, cleaning the homes of other people. But it was there that I learned the value of hard work, and I learned about my mother's work ethic. Because it was this woman with a third grade education who had the courage of her convictions to cross a border and to face a current wave of bigotry. This was a woman who paid the rent for the roof over my head, the clothes on my back, and the food on the table. So that's why I've always had a deep appreciation for the women in my life who helped shape me and who I am today. Because quite frankly, I'm not supposed to be here before each and every one of you let alone be elected to the California State Senate 
and to become later the first person of color in over a century to become the leader of your California State Senate. I'm not supposed to be here navigating a huge field of 32 candidates on a June 5th primary. And if you recall opening up that ballot, it looked like the white pages when it came to the U.S. Senate. You had so many names there, and I will say probably the vast majority of California didn't know who I was. No question about it. But that's what makes California such a magical place that the youngest child of a single immigrant mother with a third grade education could rise to become the leader of your California State Senate. And also, too, a U.S. Senate candidate before each and every one of you representing the great state of California. Because it doesn't make a difference if you're a few generations removed from Ireland, from Scotland, from Wales, from Germany, from the U.K., whether you're from Asia, China, Vietnam, South Korea, the Philippines, whether you're from Mexico or Central America. California is a beautiful mosaic. It's a, an amazing tapestry of so many different ethnicities, so many different hues, whether you're Jewish, whether you're from Israel, Ashkenazi, or Sephardic. That's the beauty of who we are in the greatest state, in the greatest nation in the world, bar none. These are very historic times, and I like what Jessica said, because she's absolutely correct. These are very historic times in our nation's history. These are also very perilous times in our nation's history. They're very dangerous times. And I think you would all agree with me that this president makes Richard Nixon look like a choir boy <laughs> in comparison. That Watergate has nothing over what's happening here today. That simple break in into the Watergate Hotel to the DNC headquarters is a simple burglary, a break in in a, a car here in the parking lot in comparison to what is happening today. And that's why I made a decision which was quite controversial, even among many Democrats, especially in Washington, that on the day that this president was elected, through the electoral college system, an antiquated Hamiltonian idea, that I would resist with results. And that's why on November 9th, the day after the election, I sent out a joint statement that many of you perhaps may have read, that in California we would resist, because I identify this president as a, as this president as a clear and present danger to our economic prosperity, to our progressive values, and to our people. And that's why I hired shortly thereafter, perhaps a few weeks after the election, the 82nd Attorney General of the United States of America, Eric Holder, to be the senior counsel to the California State Senate, to help inform my decision making. Because this is who we are in the greatest state in the nation, that as Democrats, and as progressive Democrats, we fight for all individuals, regardless of who they are and where they come from, regardless of the hue of their skin, regardless of what language they speak, regardless of who they love, regardless of which God they pray to. We're all Americans and we're all Californians. And we fight for everyone. And that includes Trump supporter as well. Because their children deserve the right to breathe clean air and drink clean water. Their children deserve the right to have access to open space. Their children deserve to have a right to have debt-free college education and quality health care, Medicare for all, not Medicare for some in America, in the wealthiest nation in the world. Their children have the right to have access to a high-wage paying job in the clean energy space. Because guess what, Democrats? We have so much to be proud of. Because in California, we've created 500,000 500, clean energy jobs. That is 10 times more jobs in California in the clean energy space than there are coal mining jobs in all of America. <laughs> 10 to 1. Now, it does help that us Democrats believe in facts and science. <laughs> and if we don't believe that the earth is flat, that helps us inform our decision-making. 
as policymakers. But I've always truly believed that when you hold the awesome responsibility of holding a political office and accumulating political capital of a course of several years or several decades, that you use that leverage and that political power to move policies that improve the human condition for all individuals. Now, public policies or legislative bills, whether they're SB Senate bills or whether they're AB Assembly bills or whether HR, House resolution bills in the Congress, those are just tactics. Those bills are just tactics because they're a manifestation of our values as Americans and as Californians. And I'm proud to say before each and every one of you that I negotiated the highest minimum wage in the United States of America, $15 an hour in California. Because no one who works full time should ever have to be forced to live in poverty in the wealthiest state in the nation, California. I'm proud to say to each and every one of you that I am the author of the most far-reaching climate change policy in America. 350, 50% 50 clean energy by the year 2030 in the great state of California. That means every time you turn the lights on, every time you turn the lights off, every time you cool your room because it's hot, every time you heat your room because it's cold, half of our energy, and it doesn't make a difference if it's Pacific Gas and Electric, it's Southern California Edison, it's San Diego Gas and Electric, whether it's a municipally owned utility like SMUD or LADWP, or it's an upstart disruptor of the status quo, like a CCA. They all are required by law to generate half of their electricity by renewable sources by the year 2030. And guess what? We're not just stopping there. We're taking a step further, because I am the author of SB 100, 100% 100 clean energy in the state of California. Because the power of the sun and the power of the wind is free. And we have to capture it to power and energize our businesses and our homes. This is the promise of a clean future for the state of California. So our children can breathe clean air. So every Californian has access to a high wage paying job, whether it's energy efficiency, whether it is renewable energy, whether it is energy storage, whether it's charging stations and transportation, electrification, electric vehicles. This is the future, but we move policies to innovate, to catalyze. We don't stand on the sidelines. We stand on the front lines, moving forward forcefully the policies that improve the human condition for every single Californian. And we can export our values to the rest of the country. Because it doesn't make a difference if you live in West Virginia, in Kentucky, Texas, Alabama, or elsewhere. They deserve to breathe clean air as well as pay less money out of their pocket for gas or utilities. That's a smart move. It's a common sense move. Our clean energy policies are not democratic policies per se, or, nor are they progressive. They're driven by facts and science that inform our decision making, to make decisions that at times can be very difficult, but you do them nonetheless, because it helps improve the human condition for all Californians. I'm proud to be the author and the architect of the most expansive retirement security plan in the history of the United States of America since the establishment of Social Security. Senate Bill 1234, the Retirement Security Act, California Secure Choice. We will go live in 2018, I should say 2019, which means every single Californian with no access to a defined benefit traditional pension plan or a defined contribution, a 401k plan, at their place of employment will automatically be enrolled in my retirement security plan. Every single Californian. The reason why is because I saw my mother and I saw my aunt, my second mother, work their fingers to the bone, only to ask my aunt in her mid-70s, now 80, 80s, do you have a retirement plan? Do you have a, a traditional benefit plan, a pension? And she says, of course not. 
I've worked all my life and all I have is a social security check. Thousand dollars on a monthly basis. That is not enough as we know to pay for the medication, the food, and the rent. So I, her aunt, or I should say her nephew, I'm her 401k plan. I'm her defined benefit plan. I am her traditional Roth IRA plan. I am it by the check I give her on a monthly basis. But her story is not unique because we have six million Californians who have no access to retirement security at their place of employment. And two thirds of those senior citizens who live in poverty today in California, two thirds of them are women. And it's immoral that women who brought us into this world, women who fed us, women who raised us, women who protected us, only retire into poverty when their arms, their backs, their shoulders, their waist, their legs physically give out. And it's immoral in the wealthiest state, in the wealthiest nation on planet Earth, that we have no retirement security for everyday working families. I'm proud to say that I pass, it's not law, but I'm proud to say that I pass single payer in the California State Senate. And I say this because we have so many Californians, as well as so many Americans whose HMO or their PPO is not Kaiser or Blue Shield or Blue Cross, it's the ER room of the county hospital. And we all know how expensive that is. When you receive preventative health care, or after the fact, when you have a tumor, it's metastasized, that you receive care through the emergency room. Again, it's unfair. But these are about values and who we are and what we aspire to be like. Again, in the greatest nation in the world. I'm also proud to say, very controversial, and I get it, I understand it, and I recognize it. But it's my values, it's our values, that as a nation of immigrants, during these very difficult times, we stand up for each other. We protect each other. Our friends, our family members, our neighbors, our co-workers. And I am proud to say that I am the author of Senate Bill 54, the California Values Act, also known as the Sanctuary State Bill for the state of California. And when the Attorney General Jeff Sessions came to California in Sacramento and announced that he was going to sue California, which he did, my response was, bring it on. Bring it on because we're ready. And the reason why I moved Senate Bill 54 forward was that this President and this Attorney General made it very clear that they wanted to initiate mass family deportations. And in order to do so, because the federal government's bandwidth physically is not enough, ICE specifically, they would have to commandeer local police departments and local sheriffs to be an extension of the federal government to detain and eventually deport our friends, our neighbors, our co-workers. And that's why I made it very clear that we are not going to be a cog in the Trump deportation machine. That we value our inclusivity, our diversity. That we value our friends, our loved ones, our neighbors, our co-workers. This is who we are. And that is the strength of California as the fifth largest economy on planet Earth. Now, I want to put this in context. The largest economy in the world is the United States of America in the aggregate as a whole. Number two, it is China. Three, it is Japan. Number four, it is Germany. And number five is your great state, the state of California, fifth largest economy in the world. And if you're remotely interested in rounding out the top 10 at number six, it's the United Kingdom, that being Wales and Northern Ireland and Scotland and obviously uh, England. It is uh, France, it is India, and it is Italy as well as Russia. So. California's economy is larger than that of Vladimir Putin's Russia, <laughs> to put this in context. But as, as proud as we are to say we're the fifth largest economy in the world, we also know that this economy has not worked for everybody. And many folks have been left behind as a result. 
And that's why we need to take our fight to Washington, D.C. That's why it is absolutely vital that we as a state remain America's exceptional example, a beacon of hope and opportunity in a very uncertain world, that we're not going to allow one electoral aberration, <laughs> reverse generations of progress at the height of our historic diversity, our scientific advancement, our economic output, and our sense of global responsibility. Not in a great state like California, my friends. Not in a great state like California. Now, some folks may have said, and they did say in the beginning, well, who is this guy? And how dare he run? And it is about the audacity of a single immigrant mother with a third grade education who had the audacity herself and the courage of her convictions, not to wait her turn, not to wait to be chosen, but to say, perhaps I can contribute. And these are very difficult times in our nation's history, that we need a voice, a voice that won't preach for patience, and perhaps ask that we be patient in the hopes that he could be a good president in the near future. <laughs> and be mindful about one thing, my friends, here in Tuolumne. That comment that was made by the senior senator was made 20 days after the tragedy of Charlottesville. After neo-Nazis marched in Charlottesville, as well as members of the Ku Klux Klan, that comment about pleading for patience, and perhaps Donald Trump could be a good president in the near future, was made three weeks after Charlottesville at the San Francisco Commonwealth Club. And I think there is a huge disconnection between what is happening in our communities throughout California. You cannot vote for two Republican wars, Afghanistan and Iraq, two ongoing wars that to date have cost Americans, American lives, more than 7,000, and have cost taxpayers $6 trillion to date. $6 trillion that we should have spent on Medicare for all, Six trillion dollars that we should have spent on debt-free college education. Six trillion dollars we should have spent on the clean energy space, creating real jobs for Americans. Now, I want to be very clear, this is not a critique, but it is a contrast and juxtaposition of values and how those values are manifested through real votes. Two Republican wars, the largest tax cut in the history of the United States of America, the largest Republican tax cut in the history of the nation that benefited the wealthy until last December's GOP tax cut. Voting for a wall 10 years before Donald Trump ever talked about a wall in 2016. Voting to allow 13-year-olds to be prosecuted as adults without mercy. And just recently, this year in February, voting to allow the FBI and the national security agencies to spy on American citizens without a judicial warrant, the FISA vote. So if we have Great Panthers that are advocating strongly for a strong retirement security plan, and someone in the national security apparatus believes well, we got some AK-47 carrying Grey Panthers out there. We better put surveillance on them. They don't have to go to a federal judge. They can do this unilaterally. That is an extraordinary amount of power being transferred from the judicial branch to the executive branch, especially with Donald Trump as President of the United States. Those are not values democratic values. We have a nominee that's before the US the United States Senate, Brent Kavanaugh. Brent Kavanaugh, my friends, did not have to be here. In 2006, we had then Democrat Senator Barbara Boxer, Hillary Clinton. We had Chuck Schumer, Harry Reid, the minority leader at the time. 
Bob Melendez. We had the late Ted Kennedy, Dick Durbin from Illinois. We had John Kerry, who became Secretary of State from Massachusetts. All of them voted no on giving Brett Kavanaugh an opportunity to have a vote on the U.S. Senate floor. And they could have stopped Brett Kavanaugh at that time because the appointment was for the D.C. Court of Appeals. And everyone knows that it is the U.S. Supreme Court and it is the D.C. Court of Appeals. That's the farm club for the U.S. Senate. And when you're told, do not allow him to have a vote on U.S. Senate floor because he can one day be a nominee to the U.S. Supreme Court. And actually vote with the Republicans to allow him to have that vote. Those are not the values of California. Because we know that this man is going to overturn Roe versus Wade. He's going to defeat workers' rights, voting rights, civil rights. And when you vote for 60%, 6-0, of all the Trump nominees to the federal bench, these are lifetime appointments, not appointments that are term limited. And we know what the strategy is of this administration. Mitch McConnell and Donald Trump. Get them very young. It doesn't make a difference what the ABA says, the American Bar Association, qualified, non-qualified, doesn't make a difference. Do you have any courtroom experience, any litigation experience? To me, it doesn't make a difference at all. If you're young and you're ideologically rigid and to the far extreme right, that's good enough for me. Because you will be on that bench for 30, 40, 50 years. And they will be making decisions at the circuit level, at the appellate court level, and the U.S. Supreme Court level. That's why you need strategic insight in the decision making that you make. Because the consequences are real for the livelihoods of everyday Californians and everyday Americans. And that's why I want to be your voice. If you give me that opportunity to be your voice, a voice of change, a voice that's not going to be on the sidelines and preach for patience and complacency, but a voice that will fight for your values, to bring about the change that is necessary for every Californian. And it doesn't make a difference. If you live in the Bay Area in San Francisco or Los Angeles, the Central Coast or the Central Valley, or the most rural areas. Tomorrow, I'm in Amador. On Saturday, I'm in Stockton. Last week, I was in the small counties of San, uh, Fresno County, San Joaquin, Mendota, Fireball, in communities where they've never seen a politician other than their own, locally, their mayors, as well as city council members. Going up and down the state of California, meeting with everyday folks, talking about what is possible, what we can aspire to, making sure that every single child has access to higher education and is not graduating not in four years, because who graduates in four years today? They graduate in five, six, seven years. Because it's not just about tuition and books. It's something called life. It's the rent. It's the food. It's your bus pass. It's your gas. And then when you graduate in six years or seven years, and then you have a mountain of debt, and you carry it with you well into your 30s and 40s, paying principal as well as interest rate. And with the cost of housing and the short supply right now, you can't even buy a house. These are the real issues that we're dealing with every single day for everyday Californians. And the rural issues, as Jessica just mentioned, on internet and broadband and net neutrality, and I'm one of the authors today of net neutrality in California. And if we're lucky, we'll be the most far-reaching, aggressive net neutrality bill in the United States of America. I just want to say, finally, Democrats, I cannot tell you how honored I'm here to be here, to have an opportunity to speak before each and every one of you, to speak to who I am, what my values are, what my accomplishments are, what my vision is, given an opportunity for each and every one of you to be your voice in the state in Washington, D.C., to export California values to Washington, not the other way around. Because I think it's time that we move our nation's capital to California. What do you think?
So finally, Democrats, I can say this. We're all Democrats here today, but we're also all different. We're dreamers and we're pragmatists. And we're all shades in between. But this is a time when we come together as one. This is a time when we defend each other and we protect each other. We give voice to the voiceless and those who are marginalized, we stand up for them. We stand up for them. This is who I am, this is who I always have been. Standing up for those who have little or no voice. And it doesn't make a difference. Again, whether you're a few generations removed from Ireland, Scotland, by the way, I am Irish too. <laughs> Kevin, you know. <laughs> My real name is Kevin Odileon. <laughs> but a political consultant told me to change it to Deleon if I want to be a politician. <laughs> but it doesn't make a difference because we're all Americans and we're all Californians. And I believe on November 6th, in three months, we're gonna make political history in the greatest state and the greatest nation in the world. With that, God bless each and every one of you, Tony, County Democrats. I wish you the very best. We're gonna win Congress, we're gonna win the Senate, and we're gonna take back the House. God bless you all, thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm going to make a few closing remarks, but I'm not going to make, I, they can't be as fiery as that, and I certainly can't uh, add much to what you heard from our fabulous candidates. But I can say thank you so much for coming out this evening. Urge you to drive carefully when you, uh, uh, when you